You are now listening to the Minority Trailblazer Podcast. Let the story begin. One time for the lovers, two times for the ladies, three times for the brothers, four times for the babies. Do you love her? 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 One time for the lovers, two times for the ladies, three times for the brothers, four times for the babies. Do you love her? 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 Brown skin, love a brown skin, love a brown. Brown skin, love a brown skin, love a brown. She my brown skin, love a brown skin, love a brown. She my brown skin, love a brown skin. Hold me down. Yeah. Welcome to the Minority Troublers Podcast, and I'm your host Greg E. Hill, the Culture Change Agent. You already know in this show we interview young, successful minorities in a variety of fields to educate, empower, and inspire our current and future generation leaders. Man, you already know. It's Thursday night. I'm tired. It's around 1030. I'm recording this podcast. And this is a special, special, special edition. It's going to be unlike any podcast you have ever heard. This is a unique interview, which actually will have a part two. Yes, I said a part two because it's only an hour long right here. A part two Q&A Facebook Live with our audience and submitting questions and really having this dialogue tomorrow. Not tomorrow. My bad. Next Thursday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time Zone. So be on the lookout for that. Once again, we will have a live recording 7.30 next Thursday on Facebook Live, on social media. You're going to see us. I'll Follow me on my platforms at Greggy Hill. You'll see, you'll see me asking for questions and whatnot, so definitely stay tuned. We're talking about some really, really, really important things, and um, I'm excited to have this dialogue. You live and direct from Durham, North Carolina, way past my bedtime. I'm just out of my mind right now, but I had to put this podcast out right now. I had some episodes in the queue, but I said, no, 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 let's hold off on those episodes right now because I think what's going on in the United States, what's going on in the black culture, what's going on in society, there's a lot of conversations we are not having. So I I, I call one of my brothers to be on this show and I'm excited because he has such a such a, a, a way with words, but also he knows what's going on in the space. He, man, I, words can't describe how excited I am about having this, bringing this dialogue to the Minority Trailblazer as a podcast. And I just can't wait for, for us to talk about some things that has been on my mind, that's been on his mind, and that's affecting our culture. So this is the Minority Trouble as a podcast. I know we talk about business. We talk about entrepreneurship. We talk about teaching. We talk about all these different things. But we have kind of strayed away from the whole political thing. So hey, it's time it's time to kind of jump into that pool for a second. And then let's let's see how I rock. So I'm gonna read a snippet of his bio, then I'm gonna get him on the show. And I tell you, this is going to be the podcast of the season. Guaranteed. All right. So we have spent the past decade organizing issue-based campaigns and leading citizens to harness their own power to create change. He's a native of Eastern North Carolina. Clinton to be exact, and while at ANT, he led several grassroots efforts to include Greensboro's largest student march between Bennett, UNCG, Greensboro College, and North Carolina ANT, a 2007 refund check rebellion. And if you know, if you've ever been to an HBCU, you know about that refund check. <laughs> and he served on the Chancellor Search Committee that selected Chancellor Harold Martin while he was the SGA president. And that is huge because Harold Martin has took a t to a whole different level, and he was one of the people that was part of it throughout his message. Also, after graduating from North Carolina a t he served as a campus outreach coordinator for Common Cause North Carolina, working with HBCUs on ways to engage college students in the civic participation. He serves on various state boards, including North Carolina a t Young Alumni Council. He's been featured on BT, New York Times, ABC Nightline News, and is a regular contributor to the Huffington Post. He also was a 2009 initiate to the Beta Epsilon period chapter of Alpha for Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. And he's also currently 
currently, currently. Oh, my bad. I almost forgot. He was also a member of the award-winning North Carolina Anti-Gospel Choir. Shout out to the Gospel Choir. And he's currently the statewide campus director for Voting Rights Advocacy Group, Democracy North Carolina. I just touched on a little bit of his background, his bio. I hope you're as excited as I am. Let's get this thing started. So without further ado, I would like to introduce my dog, my man, my brother, Marcus Bass, to the Minority Trailblazer podcast. Welcome to the show. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. It is you, <laughs> Greg Hill, the Shut prince, the <laughs> prince of the Minority Trailblazer podcast. I cannot believe it. Shut oh, man, Greg, it, it's exciting, man, to really... Honestly, to have a chance to really share with you today, man, and really be a part of, of, of this wonderful programming that you're doing for Black Millennials, brother. Um, you know, I, I, I don't count it as, as, as you know, a task to be on the phone late at night um, on these calls, doing this across the country. And just to have a few minutes to, to rap with you and rap to everybody that really listens in is, is real big, man. So thank you. No, the pleasure, the pleasure is mine because... I know what type of guy you are, and I know not only what type of guy your opinions, but also the spaces that you have been in, the stuff that you have seen that can add a lot of value and hopefully start to change. Because there's a lot more conversations, a lot more actions, a lot more things that need to be had. However, I think this is a step in the right direction. And we're not going to talk about in this podcast, but I know some things that me and you personally are working on um, in this space. So I just want to start setting that table up to future things so how we can really share with the culture um a narrative and not 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 a narrative but open up a free space to talk about certain things that's going on not only in the black community but in this world from our lens um and i think that's really important so before i even get on that tangent i want to jump in as we always do with a quote so marcus please share with our audience a quote that you live by and how you apply that quote to your everyday life Mm, up 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 you mighty race you can accomplish what you will. Uh, those are the lines of our late leader, Mr. Marcus Mosiah Garvey. Uh, those are words that I live by. Those are words that I think are very uh, prevalent today in what is probably some of the most chaotic times since uh, the era in which Garvey lived. Um, just a second to think about the words and, and the man of Garvey who established um, black power and black economics and black pride long before there was a fist in the air, long before there was a sit in, long before there were marches, long before there were hashtags. There was Marcus Garvey really building a base in which still resonates across the country. And so I think in this time in which we are going through so much chaos and a lack of leadership, lack of trust in institutions, I think is the words of Garvey that allow us to harness the power within ourselves, to lively up ourselves in all different seasons, all different professions, especially in this time, and begin to fight back and begin to stand up and really take pride in ourselves like he did uh, with the Black Star Line and that different movement. So I really, you know, those words resonate to me. Up you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. So I, I, I really want to share that with the with the tribe, tribe podcast world. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And the reason let's set the table in this podcast real quick, because this is going to be one of the more informal podcasts and less it's going to be structured, but less a billion questions on certain topics. It's going to be we're, we're going to talk about four key things and we're going to roll uh, a lot of different things within that. But I will say this is a conversation that I'm excited to have because oftentimes there's a divide. And amongst black culture between those that may call themselves woke and the the rest of the black people. And I'm and I'm honestly I'm in the rest of the black people. I, I, I'm aware of what's going on. But honestly, I'm not checking CNN every day. I'm not on what who like I know who, who, who who's been shot. I know a lot of couple th- a, a lot of things, but I'm not really aware of everything that's going on in the political space and the the the, the movements. I'm just not aware of that. that is, and, and sometimes I kind of feel out the loop and I know Bass, he's. Not to say he's on the front line. No, he actually is in front line in some cases, but he's in the mix. He knows. So I think this conversation that kind of um, sheds some light, but also have that conversation for somebody who's in it. Somebody who just wants to be more aware and where do those things mix is an important question, an important conversation to have. So, Mark, we're going to talk about four things. And we talked about it earlier and the four things about politics, education, health, health care 
and then the wealth gap. So I want you to kind of lead us in kind of the which one we which one you would like to kind of discuss first in reference to um, kind of the state of of the union in a sense of where you believe where we are as a culture, where we can do better. And from your narrative, what's going on? And I'm going to get my feedback from from my narrative. So first, man, I, I just want to um set the record straight for myself and for other people that um, have been drawn to this movement, not by, um, you know, different hashtags or by, you know, a a competition of, you know, brains, um, but really by a passion for wanting to help people and wanting to see things improve, especially in the black community. Um, I think there are a lot of people in different professions that uh, come to a consciousness or awareness or understanding of the levels of oppression and how they play out in everyday life. I think it is definitely true. I think it is very much so possible in this country to pull yourself up um, by your own bootstraps. But there are oftentimes things that weigh you down and cover your hands so you can't even tie your shoes. And I think that reality lays on folks differently. And so I think um in this current frame of what's going on across the country where you have uh, a lot of different narratives, a lot of different killings, a lot of different deaths, there are a lot of different people that express their understanding of the situations in different ways. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there's a lot of folks that really look at, um, I guess, being woke as a set of knowledges or principles or um, practices that have uh, developed somebody's you know, walk and talk and understanding. But I think, you know, just being a black person and being able to matriculate through any setting in America, you know, be it a work setting, be it an academic setting, be it a social setting, I think you have to have a level of consciousness or wokeness, you know, quote unquote, about you. So I think there's levels, you know, it's a spectrum. And I think as long as we're all moving towards the level of understanding each other and working together, um, you, you have to have your eyes open for that. Nah, nah, you hit it. You hit it on the head. So, as far as like we said, the the topics, and I, and I'm in my head, I'm leaning because I'm trying to see. Oh, and because I know you're a speaker, I'm a speaker as well, and you, and you, you were once a, a educator as well. So, I'm seeing what should go first as far as politics, education. We're talking about healthcare and wealth. Like as we start this conversation, what what do what, what do we want to expound upon first? Man, first of all, I think. All four of those topics deal with power. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about um, all of those four topics, we are looking at how power plays out in all of them. So, I mean, honestly, man, let's take a stab at the first system that we come in contact with um, would be the education system. Mm -hmm. Let's 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 hit education, bro. Okay, so in, in in realms of education and I, I can I could jump it off right here and let's let's talk about currently. Right now, the way the education system set up specifically for um, and African Americans. No, let's and this is let's let's go to your to your space because right now I know is DeVos is she the person over education, right? Bessie DeVos, yeah, yeah. So what and I and and this is oh, perfect, perfect, perfect because like I said, I want this interview to be educational, but also from a person that's not in that space, the person that kind of is aware, not to say Mark is the guru, but you're very aware of what's going on. So if I'm from the outside looking in, I know there was a lot of outrage at what she said about education. I know some people are laughing at me like, yo, Greg, how you going to be the leader of Minority Trouble of the podcast, but you don't know what's going on? Hey, don't judge me. I just stay in my lane. So, but what is, why was there such an outrage on her take on public education and then the effects of, her being in office could have on, on, on children of color? Uh, first of all, man, I, I definitely uh, have had some experience in education. I worked in the classroom and then uh, was a, a, a Uniserve director for the local uh, teachers association here out of Charlotte, uh, NEA affiliate in North Carolina. Um, so I understand some of the professional issues and then kind of see some of the federal pieces that are coming down the pipe. Um, one of the things that I see in Bessie DeVos is a lack of appreciation for um, the basic elements of what has made education for black students possible, mm-hmm. um, which has been uh, the individual uh, teaching the kids, the family unit, number one, and number two, uh, the public school. I think the public school has for years, good or bad, been a system in which we know our tax dollars go into to support 
uh, the education of our young people. As a matter of fact, in North Carolina, one of the few states that actually has public education in their constitution, it commands that the citizens of North Carolina provide uh, free access to education for every child. So I think education, particularly for African-Americans, public education has been a key. Um, but when you look at charters and this whole idea of for-profit schools, I think uh, there is uh, certain narratives of choice and of opportunity that are often veiled behind large checks that are cut to some schools uh, to do things in a way in which public schools are not able to do those things. Um, some public school teachers argue that there is a flexibility and a lack of accountability in the charter school model, um, that if those funds and that innovation and that um, new way of looking at investment were to be applied to public schools, you could have a better out output in regards to the students, the black child in particular. But I think with charters, uh, there's a big argument around the funding being drained from public schools across the country. And uh, that's just one of the many things that uh, Bessie DeVos has come in and really had some staunch um, opinions about that have affected uh, a lot of people that really view public education as one of the few lasting resources that the federal government has for our young people and the states as well, too. I think that it should it should go without saying that the states are just as much accountable for investing in the children. And I think a lot of states look to the federal government for that investment on the public level. And with uh, a lot of those dollars being in question right now, Bessie DeVos is definitely someone that we do not want to hear uh, talking about investing more in independent practices that are oftentimes led to corporate dollars in education as opposed to public investment in, in education. Yeah. And there's two things. First of all, that was phenomenal. And there's two things that I want to point out and ask you about, because the first being you've been in spaces and I've always had this on the top of my heart, on my on my head. You've been in spaces and, you know, politics well enough that I was always confused that the people making rules, the people that especially about education, stuff that affects public education, stuff that affects people of color and, and other minorities, it affects everybody. But. I feel like they're so out of touch that, that who's actually in it. So what, first of all, why, why do you think that, that, why do you think it's always been like that? And what, what things could we do to change that as far as the power, like the power stuff? And then the second question after you answer that is right now we're talking about things we can't control. I mean, I mean, we can't control government, but we can't really control that. But as far as our listeners, for those that are in that space, the, what things that we could do, I'm talking I'm talking to you, college student that's listening. I'm talking to you, 26-year-old that's listening. I'm talking to you, 33-year-old that's listening, to enable or to encourage or help out the public school systems outside of stuff that we just seen, like, go there. Um, so, so first, man, I think for the American education system, or really the American system in general, um, black was never intended to be equal. As a matter of fact, black... Uh, was considered an unequal. Um, that was really the whole precedent behind being able to enslave black people. So uh, even though we talk about the freedom of uh, all citizens now, I think today we still see remnants of that system. You know, 300, 400 years later, when you look at education in America after you begin to have integration or not even integration, just regular access to education, um, you saw a lot of white schools being referred to as normal schools. Mm -hmm. And so when you see a white school called a normal school, you can only imagine what the colored school was called. It was considered a colored school, but in reality, if a white school is normal, then the black school is the unnormal school. So um, even from that standpoint, there is a psychological um, dissonance between education for blacks, which is unnormal or uh, colored, and then the white school, which is normal. So I think, um, you know, just from that precedent, that starts a pedagogy in education that says that black students need to be educated different. Um, black students need to be um, separated from white students in regards to education. And even in regards to the output, um, when it comes down to careers, I mean, let's let's be honest, right after slavery, um, do you think that they were really trying to send a lot of blacks who were, you know, just maybe 10, 20 years ago, in the fields, now putting them in 
the Harvards or the <laughs> Yale wow, or about the Princetons. <laughs> right. So, no, they were wanting to make sure that the inferiority complex remained in these people in which some of the professors probably thought who owned slaves at the time, they shouldn't even be allowed to read. And so even though you had the access to education, uh, there was still an invisible, very invisible um, barrier to education in which black people were almost rewarded for still showing a passivity or a lack of interest in things of the academic sense. Um, even after the war, the first World War I, there was an idea that soldiers would have the opportunity to be on an equal playing field as they were equal on the battlefield. And when they came back, uh, the same jobs that were offered to them before they left, the fields and the broomsticks, um, were waiting for them when they got back. On the other hand, the same white counterpart may have received equal, if not better, um, treatment as if they had went to a four-year school through something called a GI Bill. And uh, the Black, there was nothing but the debt of the bill to pay. So I think <laughs> there's a lot of history in regards to just attainment and education and inequality that still reverberates. I mean, we think World War I is, was a long time ago. We're talking about less than you know, 100, 120 years ago. These people are still very much so. The grandchildren the great grandchildren of some of these folks. I mean, we're not talking about a long span of education when it comes to African Americans. So there has been a conscious effort to change, but there has still been an undercurrent of anti when it comes mm -hmm. to children of color and education. And and I know you know, and I, I do this all the time on podcast. There's a second part of the question, but let's talk real quick about that. There's a notion of change, but that undercurrent of anti. So how, how, how can we as people, first of all, see it? Because I think you in the narrative, like, like, cause I think you're privy to conversations and in, in places that a lot of people aren't. So how can we understand and see the underlying st stuff that people have? Like, for instance, we talk, um, offline about Charlotte, you know, the uprising and, and stuff that's happening. And I, I know that's getting out of education a little bit, but a bank, somebody made a donation and a lot of stuff kind of changed. And it's like, and a lot of times we don't see the underlying piece of it, but how can we be more aware or what can we do to be more aware of the underlying stuff? Because they say change. OK, you have these, uh, these Europeans or the government say, OK, we're trying to change education, all this other stuff. But there's so much underlying stuff that hurts us as a people. But if we're not aware of it, we kind of just go with the flow. OK. All right. So I think we are all aware of it. Every single person, regardless if you flinch or not, there is a feeling or response to something that happens to us. I think um, even folks like Cam Newton, you look and see um, the fame and attention that he has always gotten since he's been um, playing football professionally. And even before that, um, his first two years in the NFL, he was ridiculed. Uh, he was, you know, chastised for being happy, go lucky for, you know, just being a joyful and also successful quarterback. Um, I, and he has had to even now um, maybe do some things that had to assert that he is, um, you know, not necessarily the stereotypical black quarterback. Now, that manifests in a different podcast and a conversation <laughs> with some other professionals that understand the sport and understand the professional side of being an athlete and managing your brand. Um, but I think the broader idea is regardless of who or where you are, we all are affected by these things and we all are going to respond differently, man. I think. Uh, for uh, African-American female to come through society and climb the ranks or even just exist amongst the ranks. Uh, there's a different set of oppressions that we face as African-American males. Uh, I think if you look at uh, the um, LGBTQ community, the gender nonconforming community, uh, that is also very much so prevalent in the black community, the culture, the livelihood, the experiences of those brothers and sisters are a lot different than even our experiences or the experiences of African-American, uh, cis, uh, heterosexual, gender uh, conforming people. I think there's a lot of different identities when it comes down to being African-American. And right now we are at an age in which regardless of what our identity is, our skin color, our outward pigmentation is what is judged and mocked and ridiculed. And I think that has historically, generationally impacted us 
in some very interesting ways. You have some generations of people that have fought, and now this current generation is tired of fighting. Uh, you have a generation of people that have fought and they continue fighting. Uh, you'll have a generation of people um, that have participated through philanthropic interests and they'll continue to give or maybe not continue to give. And then uh, you have a subset of people that exist in this experience and um, they may act as if the ebbs and flows of life affect everyone equally. But in reality, we definitely understand that for African-Americans, um, it is a different ebb and a harder flow in regards to just being able to exist here. So the biggest thing that I would say for people that really um, are trying to figure out what to do in regards to handling the situations are to really begin to talk about and express these situations. Uh, I think we deal with oppression, hatred and racism every day. And a lot of times we ingest it like a poison. And there is no release. So how are we talking about the different microaggressions? Uh, we both have a fraternity brother that lives in Atlanta that recently had an altercation in the gym with two white guys that uh, crushed his water bottle and his things in his locker room and almost followed him around the gym the whole time. These are two white guys in the South following this young black boy. And I think he, of all guys, are probably one of the more professional people that I know and probably would never have gotten an altercation. But even he has to come to terms mm -hmm. with life in this new situation. And so I think as it rests on everybody differently, I think we'll handle it differently. But the most important thing is to really just begin to talk about and express and really show people the true side of the oppression, regardless if it's you're being looked over for a promotion or if you're being looked over in the unemployment line. And I think you hit on something there that, um, that I always question as far as talk about it. And you know, in the age and proliferation of social media, the age of talking heads, the age of hot takes, I, in my head, I'm like, yo, we do a lot of talking. So is there different realms of talking? Is there constructive talking? Is there talking to talk? Like, can you kind of deep in your, in your vantage point when you say have these discussions and talking about it? Who was doing the talking? Where do we talk at? Can you kind of break that down? And 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 I and I'm and I hate that as I pose these questions that we have this dialogue. I'm please don't ever think that I'm painting you in the corner like you have to have all the answers. However, I just want to I don't have the answers. Yeah, bro, yeah. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I, don't I don't want to be like yo, gee, I I I don't got it at all. But I just want to kind of hear your and like I said, I think your thoughts and opinions are are, are definitely valid because you've been in this space. But what does talking look like? Are we, are you feel me? You kind of get what I'm saying. So for the Minority Trailblazer podcast world in which everything is about success, it is very interesting how we handle unsuccessful or traumatic situations. I think as black millennials, uh, as college educated or as self-aspiring moguls, I think there are a lot of us that really don't want to articulate the negatives in our social media filters. Mm -hmm. But I think we'll find a lot of successful people um, in history and through the current age have been able to express their ups and their downs and the injustices that happen to them in a way that humanizes them. Uh, I think about Richard Pryor as a comedian um, during, that came during a time, just like Dick Gregory uh, before him, uh, that had a very strong um, critique of the system. But the method, the vehicle in which uh, they delivered their uh, fight to justice, their critique of the system was comedy. And so in a lot of ways, we don't have to reinvent the system uh, when it comes to expressing ourselves. I think what we need to do is be serious and intentional about what we say. Uh, I think one of the more interesting things, and I don't want to get uh, attacked by anybody <laughs> after the podcast, <laughs> G, is, um, you know, since the Trump election, we have seen a bunch of different um, trends across the political sphere in regards to America, um, the hacks, the leaks, the fake news, the, the, the Russia, the this, the that. Um, in our community, however, in our consumption-driven world, the things that have trended the most since Donald Trump has been elected in, um, some, in some communities have been the situation around uh, some hair grease, shea butter, <laughs> Uh, the situation around um, some rompers, <laughs> a romper, some clothes, and um, is one more thing. Oh, Pepsi, a Pepsi commercial. Now, 
I, I say that in in seriousness and also in humor because we got to think about the era in which we've come up. We are the consumption generation. We are the first generation in which we have been marketed to from the time we came up as children, infants, learning how to use a television, all the way up until now in which every single interaction we have is with our head bent down for the most part in a phone. I think when you look at some of the trends that have attracted us recently, it has not been some of the political trends. It has been some of the trends that have been push forward through capitalistic means. And so I just think it's interesting how, and I'm not saying that every single um, young person, every single black person has only been focused on the ads of Pepsi, the products of hair and the people that are branded in those products and the style of clothes and fashion. But I think that what has resonated the loudest has been those things. And there's a reason why um, certain things have been pushed to our demographic. There's all types of tracking and impression counting and likes and and dislikes that affect how we see and what we see online and social media. And I think in this information age, even though there may be a quest or want to know information, the overload sometimes makes us see what we think is trending to be what we should be talking about instead of really getting down to the issues of the day and building a black political base that is knowledgeable amongst our ranks. Mm, I love that. I love that. And I think this is the perfect time to transition into the political sphere. But I have to jump in the education. Last question on it. And this is a real topic. It's going to hit close to home. Hopefully it doesn't fit anybody. But it just been on my heart to kind of understand right now in the educational system growing up. Kids are dealing with a lot of different things. Back in the day, it was technology. Uh, kids wouldn't go out. Kids wouldn't go outside. They're playing on the games. Now they got games on their phones. So games is everywhere. And then, and then also too, we have to deal with a couple years ago. Um, growing up, there's honestly there's a lot. There's this heterosexual kids growing up, but there's also kids that identify um, that that like that. I'm not gonna say young homosexual kids. And like I said, please for my listeners, don't don't lose me here. But there's kids that 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 identify in certain different ways. And a lot of times we don't have those conversations in our in our community, in our households, how to how to incorporate, how to deal with that, how to grow um, with one another without excluding. So I'm just trying to wrap my head around how we as a community, let's bring it back to community right now, can be more inclusive in our conversations. That's that's what I'm working for, because I know some of y'all it's on the fence like, yo, G Hill, you stumbling. Don't don't go down that route. Don't go down that route. But all right, I got I, I got it now. I got it now. Don't, don't, don't do it. Don't, <laughs> don't do it. I'm not I didn't go there. But how do we become more open in that conversation to include? Because I think that's a huge even with the movements, Black Lives Matter and all this other stuff, there's always that tension in that thing. So, hmm. All right. So here's I here's I think I wanna unpackage that um, as carefully as possible. Uh, First of all, I want to start with self. And I think for a long time, um, we have had a patriarchal mindset to our understanding of our culture. And uh, for all intents and purposes, I love, again, the, the, the deep folks, the folks that are ready to go back to Africa. There's some interesting stuff we got to unpack when, before we get back to Africa. You know, <laughs> when we look at some of um, the major injustices that have happened um, since the overall spread of the African influence across the world. Let's be correct, you know, because there's uh, thousands of years of history uh, in between our here and what we have been told is our there, which was slavery. Before that was Africa. Before that, we were in jungles. No, before, long before that, we were influencing the world and teaching people how uh, to not drink the water that they just urinated in and how to drink regular water and how to make sure they're able to, to uh, take care of themselves. So we have had an influence that has spanned a great deal of, of generations and has supported um, many, many different cultures. But I think when it comes down to our culture, uh, we sometimes... Uh, only identify with the patriarchal uh, influences of our society. And there are many people for years that have been forced to uh, different binaries because of the patriarchal construct of our culture and our society. And so I think when we see the emergence of some of these identities, um, there is going to be a realization that these identities were always there. 
I think we have historically had to um, deal with situations of patriarchy and identity and race and class in different ways. And I think the more we talk about evolving as a people, the more we talk about liberation in a very real sense, which is something that I think our generation is more closer to now than we have ever been. I think there comes a test in that that really talks about how much liberation do you want. I think nobody is free until black women are free. And I really want to take the second to honor um, black women for the role and the sacrifice that they have played in building this country and building our people and building this world and for sacrificing on their backs in America to create a nation uh, that still does not recognize them uh, on many different levels. And I think regardless of uh, what identity you hold, We would not have any of our identities if it was not for the first identity of a black woman. And so I think understanding our role in respecting and influencing society to lift up uh, the black woman is our first role as African-Americans and particularly as African-American males. Um, The second appreciation comes from the widespread acceptance of all identities and the understanding of everybody's unique journey. and the different realities in that. And uh, that's as close as I'm going to get to that, G. Hill. You got some other folks to interview for the rest of that conversation. Yeah, nah, I, I do. <laughs> and uh, I will. And that's, and I, I, as for I, all my listeners out there, season four, we will be tackling some deeper, deeper stuff because I, it's always been on my heart. Um, it's always been stuff that needs to be said in certain catalogs. And not to say, don't, don't get it twisted. The narrative of my podcast is still getting trailblazers in their different spaces. But I do want to kind of bring um, a narrative push to to certain things that may, I, I believe that needs to be talked about. Maybe not not through my, my just my lenses, but through, through others. But now to pivot into the political sphere, because I think that's what we're talking about. Because we're talking about education, but education largely, um, I want to start educating ourselves on how we can become more politically active, politically aware, and um and so that we can hold these people politically accountable. Ooh, politically active, aware, mm. hold accountable. Because at the end of the day, we know what's going on. No, we don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on too much in the White House. I'm still confused. I'm like, what in the world? I, I just all up. So first of all, that can you break down in your lens what's going on in the White House currently for those that are kind of been on I, I like I see I saw the Time magazine cover what you shared to me. I saw I see stuff that's happening and all the crazy stuff. So can you kind of break us down with the post of what's going on in the White House as well as Start start our our dialogue with how, as a community, we can begin to take the steps to become more aware. So first, I think the biggest thing to recognize is the election of Donald Trump is not the fault of blacks and more importantly, African-American young millennials in 2016 who chose not to vote. I think. Now that the numbers have come out across the country um, and the way the lines are drawn in regards to districts and counts and especially this electoral college, we have found out that in some cases you could have had every single African-American vote uh, on the books that is registered and you still may have had the same outcome. Um, So I think from the beginning, the raw emotion uh, of folks in regards to um, the debauchery known as the 2016 election and the aftermath in regards to the resistance groups, you saw an absence of African Americans. I think the Women's March uh, really showed a tone of um, young African American women who for many years have fought again in the Democratic Party as progressives in the movement to elect many folks. And now in this whole idea of resistance and rebellion, um, they outcried that 50% of white females voted for Donald Trump. And so when you look at the effort that has been put in over the past eight years and longer to register African Americans, uh, many organizations, white led organizations, um, have benefited from the investment of voter outreach in the black community. Um, but 
when it comes down to persuasion, where it really counts most, when it comes down to race, which this election 2016, uh, regardless of what the pundits may say, was a referendum on race, was a referendum on having um, the first black president and the fear of the loss or what um, could possibly would have been understood by some um, in some way as a loss of somebody taking some power because for some out of one out of every 50 presidents, 45 presidents, uh, one happened to be an African-American. There's an outcry of race in this election uh, that really showed the ugliness of this country. Uh, mm -hmm. Even now, you see monuments across the South coming down, Confederate monuments in Louisiana. You saw some coming down in South Carolina. I'm pretty sure across the South there'll be others. Um, there has been a tone of hatred that has come from a lot of populations that also reflect the voting base of those that elected um, Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And so whenever we talk about um, what we need to do politically in regards to being aware and looking at the changes, it points back again uh, to the understanding of power, race and class, and more so in regards to politics, we're seeing a president that was elected by dollars. We're seeing a president that was elected by a capitalist system and also a racist system uh, even though you did not see, um, you know, some of the telltale signs of, uh, you know, white sheets at rallies or uh, cross burnings, you saw, particularly in the days immediately after the election, a rising of a class or a subculture within the Trump movement referred to as the alt-right. And uh, there was a lot of days in which there were rallies. And even after, whereas as recently as last week, there have been rallies by these groups um, that consider themselves not necessarily Republican, but ultra conservative. And that tone and the message that they carry um, resonates to a point in which um, we all remember where white folks did not like black folks too well. And that tone hasn't changed from then to now. We're seeing the grandchildren. And in some cases, even in elected office, uh, the children, uh, the actual students that were uh, protesting and throwing rocks at the black children that were integrating the schools, now they're in elected office. And uh, the uh, at the end of the day, what we see is uh, a president that had the ability to capitalize and galvanize that base of people who have historically had different views about how America should be ran and also controlled a good deal of capitalistic influences that allowed him to um, win the presidency in some very interesting ways and with some help uh, from uh, neighbors on the other side of the sea that being in Russia. So I think right now with a lot that is happening and the Justice Department, um, you see an increase in um, the sentences for minor infractions in drugs. Um, you hear uh, the officials speaking around increasing private prisons. Um, you hear about health care uh, now being changed to where you have to prepay before you go uh, for certain procedures and emergency visits and different medical practices, um, all because of something called Obamacare, uh, when in reality, a lot more people cared about it than just the president. <laughs> we see mm -hmm. uh, an erasure of uh, a, a good set of policies put together by a very good president that has been belittled all because of the color of his skin. And so uh, out of all that we'll see in the news and all that we'll hear around impeachment, um, and a lot of folks are talking about if he does get impeached, you know, we won't have a line of succession that'll be very good for black people anyway. <laughs> I think it's very important that we as black people begin to solidify our understanding of politics and really build our political base. Um, there are a bunch of candidates, young candidates that are running across the country, uh, African-Americans that have been engaged since the Black Lives Matter movement and before uh, folks that have been engaged uh, long ago, and even in party structures that are now coming around and running. And I think it, that is great, but we also have to have an analysis and a set of principles that govern how we vote as a block of young black people and black people in general, too. So what does that look like? What does that look like? Like, is there is there other models out there for a, a large group of people that kind of move in the same way direction as far as voting i'm talking about the last part you said as far as analysis how we move as a block of people 
um, there'll be other models. Um, the Mississippi Democratic Party is a historically uh, older arm of the Democratic Party that was really progressive, that came out of the civil rights movement. Uh, you have leaders like Fannie Lou Hamer uh, that really started to build a basis of understanding. And even now, I think it's very important to recognize that African-Americans in, in elected office is really a new phenomenon. Um, when we first got out of slavery in the early uh, part of the 1900s and late 1800s, uh, there were a large bench of candidates from across the country that were African-American. We elected more African-Americans at that time and had high percentage rates of voting, up to 100 percent of African-Americans that were able to vote at that time. Now, they were just black males, but there was 100 percent voting rate. They were able to elect candidates across the board. And then two or three years later, they were ran out of town. The cities were um, burned. You hear about um, Black Wall Streets and the Wilmington riots. Well, that was a response to Black elected power. We didn't gain power again until, not even power, just a seat at the table until 100 years later, what we see in the 1980s, different folks being elected in Atlanta and Durham and Charlotte, the first Black mayors. And now we're really about three generations, maybe about 30 years into our political analysis. So we're still very young. And America is very young in our democracy. Many countries have had at least two or three different renditions or versions of democracy. And we're still dealing with a document that was created 300 years ago at a time in which me or you weren't even thought about having power whenever the founding fathers wrote the Constitution, you know, let alone women. So I think there's a lot that is wrong with the system. And I think it's time that we really build an awareness and analysis of ourselves as independent from uh, the colonial structures of politics. And that may be a little bit too deep. I may got too far, but you know, that's, that, that's where I think we need to go. But what is that? What is that last thing you said? What does that mean? Like in layman's terms, like a build up, build about uh, identity outside a colonial construct. Like what is What does that mean for our listeners that's listening right now? What does that mean for me? How can we begin or what does it look like beginning to build our identity? Cause when I think about identity, I think about shoot, I have, to, I have to date, I have to shoot, I have to write down as far as like, I think about feelings, I think about emotions, I think about the core, I think about my parents, I think about my grandparents, I think about, uh, the society in which I grew up in, like the, the environment of, I, I grew up in my physical, but also a metaphysical. Um, I think that's, that's the identity I think about. So when you say build up our identity before that, before we can kind of get to even that whole awareness piece, what, what does that mean? Um, man, I think there are little and there have been little, independent situations in which our power has been marginalized and then there have been definite points in which we can see our power being marginalized um the outward aggressions of the death of martin luther king um the killing and death of malcolm x um maker evers you know these are faces and voices uh, that led black people that were going to lead black people uh, to a next level of heightened awareness <laughs> that was far beyond anybody's woke that we're looking at today. You know, just imagine if Martin and Malcolm could have got together. Um, we knew that and a, a different set of people knew that also. And mm -hmm. so there were efforts to make sure that that didn't happen. And there's still efforts across the board to make sure the different movements uh, don't go too far. I think you mentioned Charlotte earlier. And uh, Charlotte is the banking capital of the South. And, you know, um, during the uprising, a lot of the protests were right there in the middle of uh, downtown Charlotte. Uh, and so you mentioned that there was um, money that came into the city. There was just the, 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 the talk about um, potentially having some money invested in the community. And it broke up um, a lot of different things that were positive just because of, you know, different traumas around money and the movement. So I think, you know, there's a lot of different ways. New York is another city uh, that uses the influence of money to really uh, determine how things are, where things happen in regards to black power. Um, but I think when you look at our awareness outside of this colonial construct, uh, a lot of times we don't even know where we get certain things from in our history. Um, we talk about boys sagging and they immediately refer to people walking around in prison uh, with their pants hanging down. When in reality, sagging comes from hand-me-downs where 
your big brother went to school last year and you don't have enough money in your family to get two pairs of pants. Mm. So you have to wear the big pair of pants and you may not have a belt that fits you. So you have to walk around sagging, you know, your pants are falling down. And after a while, there's enough people in a community to do that, that it becomes a fashion trend to keep from having to deal with the trauma of not being able to afford new pairs of pants. Um, but we refer to it in a negative sense. So that way society doesn't have to do something about the poverty. Um, but then there are times where we can't really cover up um, a sag when there's a sag in the water and you're looking at Flint, Michigan, and the mm-hmm. pipes are you know, rusted out. And, you know, it's beyond just covering up stories of, oh, that's the condition that blacks are brought in into. And we really have to deal with equality. Um, I think about uh, what happened with the uh, North Dakota pipeline and the fact that there was a community not that far from where the tribe was uh, living, the reservation. Uh, But this was a white community and they rallied against having the pipeline there. As a matter of fact, I think they just sent maybe a letter or a couple of emails. And all of a sudden, the pipeline moved from that community um, right over into uh, the tribal land. <laughs> and so wow. when we look at, yeah, when we look at this colonial construct, right, and we talk about the uh, egregious treatment of other peoples and other lands, and then you look at the people of color in America, um, not just the immigrants, we could talk about the ice raids in another time, But uh, just, you know, the treatment of the indigenous people, the treatment of um, blacks who were enslaved and brought here, not as immigrants, but as uh, chattel slaves and forced to work and not compensated even, you know, 20, 30, 100 years afterwards, um, being chastised for living in ghettos in which they didn't create the ghettos, you know, being charged with possession of cocaine when there's no cocaine trees growing in the hood. (laughs) Uh, I just got back from Chicago where um, there was a story Everybody talks about the violence in Chicago in the movie that Spike Lee made, but nobody talks about the fact that a train drove through the middle of a neighborhood, a community in Chicago that was loaded with guns. This train was loaded with guns, and somehow the train became unattached, the guns opened, and a cache of weapons was released into inner city Chicago. What? Now, I don't know. That sounds like something off call, not to. That sounds like something off Call of Duty, like uh, a train, a drop off of weapons in a war zone. What? What? Do you, uh, what? There, there is a uh, there's a thing called fake news and there's a thing called um, not telling the news or not telling the truth. And I think that um, it's not that hard to really Google some of these different stories around what what has happened and what is happening. But I say that to say that we are still very much so under the same construct of colonialism and separatism that guided and governed the documents of um, our constitution. You know, so um, when we talk about really having a experience that is above the understanding of what we are supposed to be and really talks about who we are and where we need to go, that's a completely different mindset and conversation. Um, so, I mean, that, that, that is a good place to leave it. Uh, there's a couple of books and things that I would suggest to folks. And I know there's a lot of other smart, more knowledgeable people that can start people on the understanding of, you know, where we come from and where we're going. And I don't think that everybody needs to, you know, necessarily get um, radicalized, quote unquote, or jump into, um, you know, a dashiki tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But I think it's always good to at least know uh, what your name is, where you come from, how long your people have lived in a city. You know, there's some folks that think that we bloomed on the West Coast, not even understanding that <laughs> most black people, uh, if we're if we weren't born here, like the Moors or the Indians and emerged, uh, we came from, you know, the southern states out of slavery to these other places across the country. So even knowing where we originated from, what port we arrived from, that's a history that's not that far back that we don't even know about. And it's been erased intentionally. And, um, you know, there's an uncovery of that and a pride in that that we really need to get back to. You know, and that that goes along with our political understanding as well. I love that, man. I I really do, and um, I, I we're, we're we're getting close to where I'm probably gonna wrap it up because this is I'm 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 putting it out there. I think I'm gonna do it. I want to make this a special edition where this week we're talking about some things, and then next week I'm gonna open it up to 
the listeners, open it up to people that have questions or or stuff that they a dialogue that we can kind of talk about more on this thing. Cause I think it's it's too it's too meaty to leave it on one podcast, but I want to incorporate some other thoughts and opinions on this. And so next week we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna pick it up on some other spaces, and we're gonna we're gonna make it a, make it a, a small mini event, a more intimate session where we can have hear some thoughts about from from others and some other questions posed, so we can discuss. Are you down with that? Hey, I, def- I definitely want to build, man. Let- put me on twice. It's definitely important, man, for the professionals that are out there that are doing big things to recognize that they play a very important role, too. And I hope in the next um, segment we can really talk about ways that folks um, that may not necessarily feel like they want to protest or can protest or in an outward way as in like a direct action or get arrested. You know, how can you still contribute uh, to the to the effort of advancing our people, man? So I'm excited to, to keep coming back at least one more time or whenever you need me bro no nah, this is this is this is breaking new ground first of all don't don't play yourself man <laughs> second of all yeah no nah, this is definitely needed i definitely uh shoot i'm in the spirit of, of doing some new things and i definitely for my listeners out there want to incorporate more listener feedback more listener engagement i think this is the way to have it and i want to start off something that i think really matters this conversation about and i've said it all the time and it's finally finally up to me to kind of start narrating some of that but question that we need answers on and i definitely think we're, you're the man to do it so before we get off though i do i did want to ask because i, I want to leave i i am of the, the fact that there's a lot of room for growth in this space um as black people being more aware politically being more engaged educationally and all that in the third but what could you say are some great leaps or great things that have happened Great things you've seen over the last couple of years, great trends you've seen in the community as far as our efforts. And um, what do you think is some areas that let's start off with the areas that uh, the great things, and then let's start some areas that you think we can improve on around the same veins of the conversation we've been having. Because I don't want to leave this podcast anybody to say, dang, man, like we got to There's a lot of areas we got to get better in. But I dang sure believe there's some areas that we have grown in and that uh, us as a culture can celebrate in our in our achievements. Uh, so I'll, I'm going to keep it short. I'll give you uh, one good and then I'll give you one thing that is that is challenged us or that is going to challenge us. So I think um, the first good thing that we have to notice is that you can no longer call young people, young black people in particular, apathetic uh, because apathetic people don't march in the streets for their brothers and sisters that have been murdered, killed uh, and abused and oppressed. Um, When you look at what has happened in our country since the even before Trayvon Martin, we can go all the way back to uh, 2007, uh, the Gina Six and that incident that happened in 2007, 2008. And then follow up um, to the current times. We have seen an outpouring of mass protest and demonstration amongst a group of people, young African-Americans that has not been paralleled since the 50s and 60s, the original civil rights movement. And in this moment, we still have the ability to reach back to find leaders like John Lewis and to reach back and find leaders like Maxine Waters and to reach back and find some uh, even current fighters that are in the movement. And I know there's a a plethora mm, even current leaders that are in the movement. And I know that there have been a couple of uh, folks that have even come on the podcast. Uh, I think of Brother Jonathan Butler Mm -hmm. that has come on. Uh, I think of Sherelle Brown, our sister. Mm -hmm. I don't know if she's been on, but she definitely should come on. Like, there have been a bunch of folks that have been on. Yeah, Sherelle's going to be on here. She was one of the first people before I even thought of the podcast. Let's shout out Sherelle Brown. Love her. Love it, love it. But there, there's been a, a bunch of folks that have been engaged and mobilized consistently. That ha- a network has been built, a very large, expansive network of individuals that have been growing and and have been informed by a movement of the past, but are still unapologetically creating the space uh, that we have today. Uh, there's one group in particular that has started a media team, Cassius. Uh, they cover everything. They cover everything from like arts and culture and fashion. I know we're talking about Redline News, which is going to be the hard hitting conversations around um, current issues in the black community from a take of a millennial perspective. Uh, and then there's also different groups uh, that are coming up now that really look at uh, challenging 
the status quo in regards to gender identity and politics. Uh, there's a group called Million Hoodies. There's a group called the Black uh, Youth Project. And I think it is really transformative how the movement is taking shape and how we have learned from our past and how we're all connected. That's the good thing. I think one negative thing that we have seen, um, for some reason, the gap between the educated and the uneducated or trained and uh, uncolleged um, Black African American in America. We have seen a larger gap between folks that have went to a four-year school or two-year school and got an advanced degree and those that decided to stay home and work or maybe have gone to the military. And for some reason, these groups very rarely talk, um, even when they're related, are there a lot of conversations. Mm. And I think when you just look mm. at our subgroup of people that very rarely communicate and the different um, stereotypes that grow from that, and you add that to the growing divide between the young people and the old people, uh, these are big gaps that were not here um, 40, 50 years ago. I think SNCC and SCLC are good examples of a young and old movement uh, working together to do some good things. But there are very few examples of that today. And you couple that with this education gap. And really, education only comes down to how much you could afford and, you know, how much time you had to pay attention and listen here and who was afforded this and that. When at the end of the day, regardless if you're pushing a broom at the Fortune 500 company or at the top level, it's still the same plantation. Uh, and at the end of the day, you're one paycheck away from being in the same situation. We still are taught that this distance of four years or six years or eight years between each other has created this ulterior universe in which the two things are not the same. But in reality, after that CEO, that black lawyer, uh, takes off his suit and puts on his basketball uh, shorts and his T-shirt to go exercise, he is looked at by society in the exact same way and can face the exact same penalty of being black in any neighborhood, in any street. And until we really come together and understand that, um, and I think it's coming a little bit. You see the Crips and the Bloods coming together um, during, especially in Baltimore, right after the incident that happened in Baltimore. I think if we really figure out how to close some of these gaps a little bit more, uh, we would be a, a lot better. But that's a big challenge of our generation. Wow. Yeah, it is. It is. And once again, this is a special, special, special episode. We're going to be back next week. Talking about, I'm, I'm, I got the Q and A rolling out, so I'll be asking on Facebook. Make sure you're following Gregory, or no, my bad, I forgot my Facebook name, Greg E Hill, Greg E Hill on Twitter, Greg E Hill on Snapchat. Find me out. We're gonna, I'm, I'm gonna be putting out some questions. I'm gonna have Bass put out some questions. We're gonna live stream this thing probably around. Are you gonna be free seven thirty next Thursday? Can you be free? Say no more. All right, Say 7, no more. 7.30 next Thursday is set in stone. We will be back to continue the conversation. And once again, this is a special edition episode. And I'm going to title it Conversations We Never Have. Conversations We Never Have. Conversations We Never Have. So thank you so much for tuning in. I know this was an atypical episode. But hey, these are conversations that I know has been on my heart. Hopefully it's been on y'all heart. And uh, hopefully we, we learned some things. We've been challenged in some ways. Some questions are sparked in our head. And make sure you send them to me at greg at greggyhill.com via email. And I'll be putting stuff up in the atmosphere. So Bash, thank you for your time. Thank you, bro. And I look forward to talking to you next week, all right? All right, we'll see y'all next week. All right, Trailblazing Nation, you already know what it is. Remember to change the freaking culture. Love y'all. Good night.